Next up, we have our very own Taj Traja talking about UTXO. Let's welcome him. Hi. Okay, this works. Hi, so I gotta go quick. Um, I'm gonna talk about UTXO, which the general idea is uh, full nodes in one kilobyte. Okay, oh, can I get it to mirror? No, okay, that's gonna be awkward. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I'm Taj Raja. Work, well, mirror would be cool. Um, yes, I can see. Whatever. Uh, so yeah, I work here at the MIT Digital Currency Initiative. That's why I wore the shirt with Corey. Did Corey just? No, Corey's there. Neha, some maybe other people. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Um, so I was co or still am co author of the Lightning Network paper. Worked on discrete log contracts, which I announced, uh, I talked about last. Uh -oh last year at the uh, expo, and today I'm gonna talk about another scaling solution, another scaling uh, strategy that I've been working on for eh, six, nine months, something like that, called UTXO. And it's really cool. I forget what I was gonna say. <laughs> uh, it's just hard, you can't work on it. Okay, uh, I'll just look at the screen. Okay, so it's, no. I, okay, uh, can, I can't see. Can you do that little, yeah, that thing. That may be a little. There, eh, that's good enough. Okay, now I can see everything. Yeah, okay, so for questions, uh, if you have questions, come bug me after. I, I can try to do a couple questions, but I probably won't have a ton of time. Um, okay, so scalability's been a concern in Bitcoin for the whole time, right? This is, um, <laughs> um, so it's, in fact, the first thing anyone said about Bitcoin. So in 2008, uh, Satoshi was like, hey, I made this thing called Bitcoin. And some guy on the mailing list was like, sounds like a great idea, but it doesn't scale to the required size. Um, so if you look at Bitcoin right now, it's like 220 gigs for the blockchain. Uh, the chain state data is, is around three gigs. So the 220 gigs is the blockchain, right? You have to download every block verify every signature, uh, except you don't, and then you know, keep changing the UTXO set. And the UTXO set is the set of all the coins. Uh, that's around three gigabytes. So you need to download and process about 220 gigs to get to the end state of three gigs. Uh, so a lot of people maybe don't know, you don't have to hold all 220 gigs. You can run Bitcoin, you say pruning equals 5,000 or whatever in your, in your config file, and it doesn't take up that much space. It takes up a couple gigs. Um, that's not the default, but maybe it will be soon. Okay, so how do you reduce this UTXO set, right? You, you, you have all these things that help, right? Lightning helps, SegWit helps, lots of things help, and so this is a new idea called UTXO. Uh, UTXOs are where the Bitcoins live. They're called unspent transaction outputs. I don't know where the X comes from, but I think that's been what we call it for a long time. Uh, also, there's a lot of confusion where people think that like addresses hold coins but really it's more like coins have addresses. Um, so a UTXO has an address sort of in it, uh, but an address does not have UTXOs in it. Okay, so UTXOs, they're pretty small. They're like, I don't know, 50 bytes, not that big. Um, but there's a lot of them. There's like 60 million of them. Uh, and actually it's, it's been going down the last year or so. I don't know, it, it peaked sort of in that whole bubble end of 2017 thing. Uh, and then actually this number of UTXOs has been going down. So this is the total number of outputs, individual coins. Uh, generally though, it goes up, right? If you look long term, it's going up. Uh, if you have Bitcoin in any real sense, you have to have at least one UTXO. Now people can use exchanges where there's one UTXO that's sort of shared between a lot of people. Not as great. Uh, although something like Lightning, you could have fractional ownership of a UTXO in a more cryptographically secure way. Okay, so. Yeah, long term, the expansion of this UTXO set is a concern, and it has been from, for a long time. So the, the blockchain itself, you can prune it. You can say, okay, well, I verify all these old blocks, and then I throw them away. I don't need to keep them on my disk, and I can still be a full node. I can still verify. Um, but if you don't have the UTXO set, you cannot verify signatures uh, because you have no idea like, what the public key is even supposed to be. You can't even tell if that UTXO that's being spent exists. Um, so one idea is SPV. SPV is pretty widely used, but there's a lot of problems with it. Um, 
the SPV relies on the miners being honest and saying the right thing, and, and you're not checking up on the miners in the case of SPV. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty different security assumption. Um, also, there's a lot of privacy problems with SPV in that you end up basically brought, you know, telling all of your addresses to some computer you've never seen, and now all of your addresses are now linked by someone. Uh, there's, there's work on improving this, uh, the, the block filters and stuff, but it's still an issue. Um, okay, so a great way to deal with this UTXO set is we don't actually need the whole UTXO set. We just want to verify that certain things are in it at certain times. So when a block comes in and there's a few thousand uh, outputs being spent, you need to know that those few thousand outputs and what they are, but the rest of the 60 million is not active at that time. So an accumulator would be something that helps. Um, so accumulator is a cryptographic construction where you hold some data, uh, but it's, the idea is hopefully it's small. It's like constant size or logarithmic size. You can keep throwing data into it and it doesn't really get bigger or it gets bigger very slowly. Um, and then people can provide proofs that you threw something into it at some point prior. Um, so a really simple one, you only has addition and proofs. Um, where you add elements into the accumulator, you get back a new accumulator and a proof of that, that inclusion. And then you can verify, given the accumulator, an element to verify inclusion of and a proof. And it returns, yes, true, this is in there, or false, this is not in there. Uh, so what we need for a UTXO accumulator, we also need to be able to delete, right? If you can only throw stuff in it, then you can't prevent double spends because someone can prove that they have this output and then they spend it and then in the next block they prove they have it again and you spend it again. Um, so you need to be able to add, delete, prove, and verify. Um, a nice thing is that you can tie delete to verify, because the only time you need to verify that a UTXO exists is when you're getting rid of it. So that's really nice. You know, coins appear, you know, an output appears, weeks pass, and then the output is deleted, and that's the only time you need to know that it exists. So we can optimize based on that. Okay. So how would this work? How would you have like an accumulator-based ecosystem in Bitcoin? Um, you could have these nodes, and potentially all of the nodes, only store the accumulator itself and not the UTXO set. So they could store this very compact representation. You know, it's a representation that's cryptographically secure of the UTXO set, but they don't know what the UTXO set is. Uh, and then wallets would manage the proofs. So if you have a wallet and you've got five UTXOs, you maintain proofs that those five UTXOs exist that you can then give to anyone else in the system and say, hey, I have these coins. Um, so that when you're signing a transaction, spending your coins, you prove to everyone else that they exist, then you also prove that you're, you're the owner, right? So uh, these proofs are public. Anyone can track uh, UTXO proofs. It's all public data. Um, and, but it's sort of the same responsibility, right? If it's your coins, you need to prove to people that they, they exist, and you also need to prove to people that they're yours. And that one of them, you know, proving it's yours is the private key. Uh, proving that they exist is this cryptographic proof. Um, and it's a nice sort of incentive system in that right now, right now you can have things that are sort of like externalities where an exchange has like 10 million UTXOs and sort of makes all these dust outputs and weird non-op return things. Uh, and that's not so good. Uh, whereas in this case, it's like if you have a wallet and you're running it in a weird way where you have a million UTXOs, that's on you. That's a, that's a larger resource cost, cost on you and it's a minimal resource cost on the rest of the network. So that's a nice way to look at it. Um, so there's, there's recent work, uh, Benedict and other folks at uh, Stanford that's really cool about using RSA accumulators. Uh, and they've gotten much more compact uh, and fast proofs and, and verification for RSA accumulators. Uh, they also said that you could use class groups. Uh, it's a bit novel. There's, there's some ideas there. I think it's really cool, um, but there's a, there's a difficulty in this where you can't aggregate proof updates. So the proofs change, right? Every time a block occurs, new things get thrown into the set and things get taken out of the set and the proofs actually change. Even though the UTXO hasn't changed, everything else, else around it has changed and so the proof has to change because the accumulator's changed. Um, and in the RSA case, you can't, let's say you have a million UTXOs uh, and you wanna change all million proofs at once due to a block coming in. That seems not possible in the RSA accumulator sense. Um, why would this be a problem? And, and it, is, it is possible in, in my design, a uh, hash-based accumulator, which has other disadvantages. This is much smaller, and it's really cool, but uh, it does have this disadvantage, and why is this a problem? Um, so I said that wallets need to track their own UTXOs, and that's a nice idealized, like, yeah, every wallet 
will track their own UTXOs, provide inclusion proofs, keep their own private keys. In practice, this is not going to happen. Um, <laughs> so this seems like no problem, uh, but one of the e easiest to understand problems is the, is the bootstrapping problem, where if I write this software and I say, cool, I'm using an accumulator, and I have proofs for all my UTXOs in my wallet, and I connect to the network, and I say, hey, everyone, give me a block. And they give me a block, and I say, okay, now give me the proofs. And they're just like, what are you talking about? We have never heard of this. We're running 0.17.0, and what is this proof thing you want? So if I'm the first person who tries to use this, no one will give me proofs. Even if I'm the second or third, I need to get everyone in Bitcoin and every wallet to start supporting this thing. It's technically a soft fork because you're requiring a new thing, but it's, it's not going to happen. Um, so what you need, and I believe Peter Wool came up with this term and actually sort of inspired a lot of this research because he said, yeah, all these accumulator ideas aren't going to work because you need a bridge node. Um, and the idea of a bridge node is it maintains a proof for everything. So it's got the whole UTXO set, and it's also got this accumulator, and it's also got a proof for everything in the accumulator. So that when it sees a transaction without a proof, it can just stick proofs on and then hand it over to the people that want the proofs. Um, this is problematic for RSA accumulators because updating those proofs, you know, there's 60 million of them. And if you have to do those one at a time, that's potentially 60 million RSA operations. And actually it's worse because it's potentially one operation for each change in the accumulator. So it's like if there's 5,000 changes in a block, 5,000 times 60 million, it, it gets, you know, feasible with like many racks of servers, but not very Bitcoin-y because we want this to be able to run on crummy laptops. Um, Okay, so the UTXO accumulator is basically a Merkle tree. I hope people are familiar with Merkle trees, right? You, ha, the parent is the hash of the two uh, children concatenated together. Um, and you only keep the top, right? In a regular Merkle tree, you're like, yeah, I throw away everything at the bottom, just keep the top of it, and then people can prove stuff in it. Um, and you prove inclusion of a leaf by giving a little branch of you, you hash the siblings. Um, so let's make a Merkle tree accumulator for UTXOs. A bridge node in that case would just store the whole tree. Right, so if you, and then it can create proofs very quickly. So you say, hey, here's my, you know, here's an input. Someone gives a proof for it just by going up the tree. Um, also, the proofs are inherently aggregated. So when I change anything in that tree, uh, the top will change, right, because the top is basically a hash that commits to everything in it. Um, but the proofs also change sort of for free. So if I change one leaf down here, um, a proof somewhere up, up there will intersect it. Um, in this case, you need to use a bunch of trees. So it's not constant size the way a Merkle tree is. It's actually log n, which is not too bad, but sort of gets you. It would be cool if it was O of 1, but whatever. Um, so I'll go real quick and sort of click through the basic idea of how this works, um, how to add and then how to delete. OK, so let's say you have a regular old Merkle tree and it's got four leaves. And you know you hash to get the parent. Uh, and then I want to add some. So in this case, I only keep the root. Right? I only keep the root of every tree. Uh, I want to add something. So I know I have four things. Oh, so I didn't say, but you also need to keep track of how many leaves there are. So you don't just keep track of this accumulator. You also need to keep track of how many things are in it for some of these things. Uh, that's, con I guess that's technically log size because the number of bits to represent a number is log of that number. Anyway, uh, you keep this root. You add something to it. So you're like, okay, now I have five things. Uh, I keep the four root and I keep this new thing and it's just on its own. Now I want to add again. Okay, now I have six things. This is a little weird, though. So I have two, I have one thing that I know has four things in it, four leaves in it, and then I have two individual leaves. Since I have two individual leaves, I can compute their parent, and now I just hold these two things. So I know I have six objects. I've got a tree with four and a tree with two. Now I add another. Okay, that's seven. So now I have three trees, a tree with four, a tree with two, a tree with one. I add again. Okay, now I have four, two, and two individual leaves. So I can compute the parent of that. Uh, and now I can compute the parent of these two guys, and now I've got two roots with eight each in it, I can compute the parent of those, and now I've got a 16, I throw everything away except for the top. Uh, so this works incrementally for adding. You can also see how, well, you can batch quick, actually, batching is no quicker than doing this uh, in terms of hash function evaluation. So really, if you wanna add 100 things at once, just sequentially add one at a time on the side, it works. Uh, so this is cool, this is not novel. Uh, I mean, it's, it's cool. I, I don't mean not novel in a negative sense. There are papers describing this. Uh, what I think is novel, yeah, so, okay. Forest, you perfect forest adding, you have a forest of perfect trees, right? So every tree has a power of two number of leaves in it. That actually helps with some weird things that have, sometimes occur in Merkle trees. Um, so yeah, all trees have two of the end leaves. 
Now, deleting. Deleting, I think, is novel. I looked through papers. I think this is new, but who knows. Uh, worst case, I, I try to publish, and then someone's like, hey, wait, here's a paper from 20 years ago where they do this. Oh, well. Um, so you first need to prove something in order to delete it, which matches up really well with uh, our case in Bitcoin. Uh, and then you sort of twin swap root. I'll talk, up, I'll talk about that. Uh, so the idea is you have three sort of algorithms. Um, if you have two deleted siblings right next to each other, you can skip those and just delete their parent. Um, if you have one deleted node, one deleted, it's not necessarily leaf, but node, and another over here, you move them around uh, so that they're next to each other, so that the deleted objects be, are next to each other. That seems like that might not be possible because you might not know what's in the tree. But it actually is the case where if a deletion is occurring, the proof of inclusion will give you enough information that you can always perform this swap operation. Uh, and then the root operation is if there is a root at the height you're dealing with uh, and there's a deletion, you can move that root to where the empty gap is. If there is not a deletion, you instead move the sibling of what the empty thing is to the new root. So I'll, it's a little complicated. I'll try to go through one quick example. Um, so let's say you've got seven objects and you know the roots you're storing, the accumulator itself is 12, 10, 6, and now uh, 2, 3, and 4 get deleted. So the proofs for 2, 3, and 4 are just going to be, uh, the proof for 2 and 3 is just 8, which is nice. They sort of squish together. Um, the proof for 4 is just 5, and 6 is on its own. OK, so you know, you actually know a couple things here, right? You know 12, 8, 2, 2 3, 4, 10, 5, and 6. Um, 2 and 3 are twins, so you're good. You just say, OK, I'm going to delete 9. Uh, and then there's nothing to swap left once you've dealt with 2 and 3, uh, so you just have to deal with 4. Uh, 4 is the last deletion, 6 is a root, so 6 moves to 4. And now you go up, you delete 9. OK, now you're left with 8 you know, 9 you know, actually 10 you know, I didn't, it's, you know, 10 you can compute because you know 6 and 5. Uh, so yeah, there is a root 10, you move 10 to 9. Uh, and now you've got a smaller tree, right? You had 7 things, you delete 3 of them, now you have a tree with 4 things in it, 1 root, you can compute that, and now your accumulator is back down to a single hash. Cool. Uh, so this, this does work. It's a little complicated, but it's super fast for a computer to do. Uh, for the computer, it's just like I swap some pointers around and I compute some hashes. It's easy. Uh, it's, I mean, yeah, it's very fast. It doesn't impact uh, speed much. OK, so yeah, deleting. You can batch delete a lot of it at a time. So generally in, in Bitcoin, it'll be like a block worth of uh, UTXO spends. Uh, you want to keep stuff in there? Oh, yeah. So the, and then the other thing is proofs. So the main downside here, now you've got these proofs. And they can be kind of big. So what's nice about this is you're adding new stuff on the side over here. And the side over here has smaller trees. And the thing is, a lot of times UTXOs appear and disappear really quickly. I have a histogram of like how long they live. It's kind of interesting. It, there's a big bump at six. Like everyone waits six confirmations and then immediately spends their coins. Um, but the idea is like a lot of times coins don't last that long. UTXOs don't last that long. So if you can push them all to the side in the smaller trees, your proofs generally are going to be smaller. And you have all these old UTXOs. You know, Satoshi's coins are all the way in this giant tree on the left. Uh, but that's OK, because they never get spent. Uh, yeah, so the downside is proofs. So one proof is around 20 hashes right now-ish. Uh, there's about, you know, the total tree number of trees is like 20-ish, because it actually changes. But uh, with 32-byte hashes, that's like 640 bytes for a proof. That's bad, right? If you have 5,000 inputs in a block, which is high but possible, that's like 3.2 megabytes for total proofs. That's no good. That means your, your 200 gig you know, IBD is going to get way bigger. Uh, so yeah, proofs are going to be several times the size of transactions. That's bad. IBD would be like 600 gigs of proof data. That's, that's no good. Uh, but proofs can be aggregated, right? where I sort of showed in the Merkle tree. A lot of times, if, if things are next to each other, the proofs get a lot smaller, because you prove many things with a, a smaller branch. Uh, so if you just aggregate within a block, uh, you bring down the proof total size to like 240 gigs, which is slightly more than the total existing data. So it's like a 2x over, you know, 100% overhead. Not great, but feasible. Um, there's a lot of optimizations. That's probably most of the work is how to optimize to make the proof smaller and faster. Uh, you can remember nodes in trees. So like if you have some RAM, you could remember like the last blocks of proofs. You can also ask nodes what's coming up. Because when you're doing initial block download, the servers know which, how long these uh, UTXOs last within the accumulator, and they can tell you, and you can cache things. 
Okay, so yeah, they know the future. I'm gonna go real quick. Uh, remember. Okay, so yeah, and as I was saying, uh, you you use a lot of times the UTXOs only last a few seconds or a few blocks. Um, so you can you can cache a lot, and that uses more RAM, uh, but it's often a good trade-off. So the idea is, if you want to be like hardcore and you're like, I'm using UTXO, I have one kilobyte of memory devoted to to the blockchain or the UTXO set. You can do it, but you're going to have a you know 100% plus. Uh, data overhead, where you're going to have to download an extra 200 gigs of proofs. And, and that's going to keep up as you're keeping up with uh, the blockchain. If you have a bit more RAM, you say, hey, I have a laptop. You know, it's, it's crummy and old, but I have a couple hundred megs of RAM I can use. Uh, then you'll be able to store a lot of this parts of this tree and, and download less. So here's sort of preliminary results. I think, yeah, and like, you know, grain of salt, this might change, this will change, hopefully for the better, but it might get worse. Um, but so the idea is if you have no RAM at all, you need to download about seven, almost eight billion hashes for IBD up to, this is a few weeks, maybe two months ago. Uh, so your overhead's like 100%, which is you know, bad, but like totally doable. Uh, if you devote 300 megs uh, of RAM, then you, you reduce your download size, your extra proof size to like 68 gigs, you know, almost 70 gigs. Uh, and then if you devote 11 gigs all the way up to 11 gigs of RAM, then you never actually download any proofs because you're storing the entire trees yourself in memory the entire process. Uh, that's kind of silly, but it actually still makes sense in some cases, because you're like, hey, I store such a small amount. If I unplug my computer and lose this 11 gigs, I'm going to have to download more, but I don't have to backtrack. So that's pretty cool. Um, these are preliminary. I, there's really interesting problems in how to optimize this. Um, these numbers, the RAM used, that's max, and it uses, usually uses way less. And so I, I can see that like, there, there's a lot of uh, room for optimizing this and hopefully bringing these numbers down. Um, OK, you can also cheat. Uh, hopefully people, so like a lot of people, when I, when I talk about this, they say, oh, it's a UTXO commitments. I'm like, no, don't commit to these things. But you could. Uh, you could put the, the root of all these trees in the you know, Coinbase transaction, and then people could just skip the validation completely. Uh, hopefully they don't. But there are use cases for this. Like if you have a desktop, you sync up the blockchain, and then you, you trust your desktop. Like, it, it's a good desktop, and it verified all the signatures, and everything's good. And then you can make a little QR code with the entire UTXO set, you know, the entire state of the accumulator, and then take a picture with your phone, and now your phone's synced up. Because you're, you're transferring that entire verified set to your phone, and it takes a few hundred bytes. So that is a useful use case. Um, but yeah, people will definitely abuse this. Uh, oh well. Uh, so yeah. Finishing up, things to improve. Uh, right now, there's, there's probably a ton of optimizations in the code you could make to make it faster. Oh yeah, I'm only using a single core, and so it takes like six hours to sync up. Um, hopefully this will speed things up a lot, especially for people who are using nodes with hard drives. Uh, so I have a laptop with a hard drive, and the CPU usage is like 10%. It's mostly disk I.O. bound. Um, this will hopefully make your, your, your synchronization process CPU bound. Um, in many cases, it already is CPU down. So in some cases, if you have a really nice computer with an NVMe SSD, and UTXO isn't really going to help. It's not going to make it any faster. Um, so who cares? But I feel like it's you know, our job to like, help the, the crummy computers, because we want you know, everyone to be able to use Bitcoin. If you already have a great computer, you're fine. Um, oh, yeah, I want to I make a proof that you don't actually need collision resistance for this hash function when computing the tree. I'm pretty sure that's true, but that's a little scary. Uh, so I think you could reduce the, the hash output size quite a bit and then get a, a lot of uh, space savings that way. Uh, other stuff. Yeah, oh, it's not a fork, so that's cool. I don't need a soft fork. Miners don't care. We can just start running this. Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer kind of thing, like compact blocks or like 151 style. Uh, so that's nice. Permissionless innovation. OK, uh, yeah, long term, help scale. People who have hard drives, uh, you can run a full node with one kilobyte of space. That's really cool. You could run it on like a router, maybe, maybe. Uh, and there's code up. I'm still trying to write the paper. I was hoping to have it done by quite a while ago, but yeah. Um, okay, we have like four minutes for questions. <laughs> yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. What do you expect to do in running the bridge node? Ah, who can run the bridge node? Ah, I didn't say, yeah, so running a bridge node is not that bad. It's about 10 gigs of space uh, on your drive and n very minimal extra CPU. So I think ideally it would be some like option maybe later built into Bitcoin Core. We could say like bridge equals one. And then it's just a regular Bitcoin D can run a bridge node. Uh, initially I'll have like a little server program to do it. Uh, but it'll be like it'll be like running an archive node today, 
where you don't need to. You don't need to hold the 220 gigs of space and, and serve that to people. But people do because it's like fairly low cost and, and it helps the network. Uh, so I don't think there's any like incentives. You don't need to make like an ICO for like UtrexO coin to like incentivize bridge nodes. Um, but it's it's fair. You could also you could in theory shard that to like make it so like bridge nodes are partial bridge nodes. That makes it really complicated. And right now it's it's not that big. So I think you can just run it on a regular computer. Yeah. No, no, it is. It is. Yeah. So, so if if so, normally, in, in what I've talked about is just normal usage where a block comes in with proofs and you delete the UTXOs. You could also provide that same proof and say, I'm not actually spending my coin. I'm just proving it exists, and that means it's still unspent. It's still in the accumulator. Um, so you could provide a compact, you know, 500 byte ish proof that your coins exist uh, without spending them, and that would be sort of out of band. That would be you know, verified in some like UI somewhere. So you, you could you could do that. Yeah, they change every block. Yeah. So so you can like you can prove at this block height this thing exists, and then if you know a couple hours later you say, well, here's my new proof. It's changed a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're synchronizing, so if if someone gives you a proof and then you download the next block, you can you sort of get the modification of the proof for free. So if you're staying up to date and someone gives you a proof from a week, you know, and you, keep, you can keep that proof up to date for free. But yes, proofs are specific to a certain block height. Uh, I, I don't think you, uh, that's hard to fix. <laughs> but it's not, in practice, it's not too bad. Have you thought about the additional constraints this imposes on light clients and offline signers? OK, so light clients. Yeah, SPV, I didn't talk about. But yeah, SPV will have to use. Uh, bridge nodes. SPV nodes don't download everything. They don't verify the things. So that, that's another reason you'd, you'd probably want. Bridge nodes would be cool if it was like transition, so everyone started doing this. But yeah, this does not support SPV. But yeah. So it seems like uh, if all white wallets would have to go through a bridge node and give up privacy via SPV. You don't give up privacy using a bridge node. It's, well, maybe eventually if you're the only person that needs one, because everyone's using this. Uh, but initially, anyway, all the transactions are going to not have proofs, or, or almost all. And so the bridge node is just taking every transaction it sees in the mempool, sticking proofs on it, and sending it over to the few people who are using this. So yes, if you're the last person to not be using UTXO, which seems cool, but like not going to happen, then you might have some privacy impact. But, but initially, it'll just be you're just the same. You send a transaction to the regular network, a bridge node sticks a proof on it, and gives it to the people who want it. Does anybody else still have the whole history? Yeah, so this, so the, the blockchain, you know, someone still got that uh, blocks folder. That doesn't, that doesn't go away. Uh, so that's a, a separate thing. So yeah, and, and from that blockchain, you can create all the proofs, all the things. It just takes a while. Yeah, so we don't lose that. Okay, okay. one more? Oh, Warren. So going back to the question of being able to verify an older proof when your bridge node has already moved on, <coughs> Uh, is there any optimization? Optimization? Yeah. How store the earlier state? Right. So you could. So the the the, the um, accumulator state is pretty small. So you could store the last thousand accumulator states if you wanted, and then you could verify old proofs. Um, in practice, what I think you'll you you could do that. Another thing you can do is just when you get a proof, you keep the proofs in your mempool up to date every time a block. Comes. So when a block comes in and you've got a bunch of uh, proofs that haven't, you know, the, those transactions haven't been included, you can update those proofs yourself. Um, because, because whenever you're updating your own accumulator, you get all the proof updates sort of for free uh, because it's just changes in that tree. So if someone's got an old proof, you know, if someone creates a proof but it's a couple weeks old, they're going to have to resign. So that is a little ugly unless someone keeps a lot of old stuff. In practice, what you'll just have is uh, the bridge node. We'll say, here's this old proof. I know the new one. It'll stick a new one on. Okay. okay. Thank cool. you. Thank you, Dad. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.